Welcome, everyone. Let me first apologize for the absence of Mr. Sean Oscott, chairman of the Aloha Fisherman's Corp. My name is Marlon Gardner. I am the treasurer of the Aloha Fisherman's Corp, likewise the sanctuary manager of the Scorpio Bay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, the GEF Small Grants Program staff and residents of the Scorpio Bay surrounding communities, welcome. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to a special town hall meeting dedicated to the discussing the result from the project, evaluating Discovery Bay's inshore coastal water quality to improve capacity for environmental management. This is a project conducted by the Aloha Fisherman Corp along with the UWE of Discovery Bay Marine Lab. Within the vicinity of Discovery Bay, with grant funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, which is implemented by the United Nations Development Program. The Aloha Fisherman's Corp was founded in the 1960s and became a formally registered agency in 1999. Its mandate has been to increase the connectivity of local fishers with the main agency in Kingston that provides assistance to fishers island-wide. Local fishers have since gained a representative voice to those lobbying on their behalf at the governmental level in Kingston. An increased level of communication between themselves and other fishers around the island and the ability to purchase equipment and supplies at discounted prices without the added cost of having to travel to Kingston. Since Aloha was formed, we have had a number of positive partnerships with our neighbors, the University Discover Bay Marine Lab. We had worked together to establish a no fishing area in the 80s and eventually the Discovery Bay Sanctuary in 2009. The, th the sanctuary needs some improvement, but it's working. We have larger fish, more fish, and some reefs with real money-making potential. This project to test water quality in points of interest in the bay is critical to deal with old and new issues and we look forward to the result and your feedback. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Delroy Thorny, and we'd like to thank Mr. Marlon Gardner for this introduction to the meeting. So I'd like to now bring to the stage Mr. Camilo Trench, the academic coordinator at the Discovery Bay Marine Lab. He'll give us a little more insight into this whole project, and then we can jump right into the results. So Mr. Camilo Trench, could you please make your way to the stage? Thank you, sir. Very much welcome. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's a great pride to stand here this evening to discuss the results of the the Aloha um, project. This project is funded by the Global Environment Facility Small Grants Program with support from the UNDP. Now, Aloha and the Discovery Bay Marine Lab have a good tradition of working together. Even before they established the formal establishment of the sanctuary or the Special Fishery Con Conservation Area in 2009, Discovery Bay Marine Lab with support from the fishermen in Discovery Bay, we had established a no fishing area um, in the west side of Discovery Bay in front of the Marine Lab. And now the entire Discovery Bay is a no fishing area. And we're having some good results, even though in discussion, and as Mr. Gardner pointed out earlier, one of the issues in Discovery Bay now is a good issue. The issue is that Discovery Bay has the potential and Discovery Bay is working the money from it. And let me put it in context. Since we may have a couple 
a dozen people listening, and this is recorded. Right now, coral reefs in Jamaica are severely underused. This is the part of what we call the blue economy, anything to do with the sea. Now imagine which, well, if I should ask you a question, which section of the sea in Jamaica is making the most money per capita from tourism every day? Which reef, which ecosystem? You know, some of you might, anybody have any answers for me? Where in Jamaica I think is making the most money? Hmm? Down west? Ochi? Negril? All right, very good guesses. I don't have a definite answer for you, but let me give you an example. Down in Falmouth, there's a place called Glistening Waters. Glistening Waters on a good day can see up to 1,000 visitors per day at 25 US dollars per head. And believe you me, the prettiest reef in Jamaica is not seen anywhere near that. So we are underutilizing our reefs. And Discovery Bay has some really good reefs with some very good fish counts because of the establishment of the sanctuary. So one threat to that is poor water quality. And we have some historical issues and some new issues which are of concern to the community. So in, in conjunction with Aloha, we put this project together. And I must say thank you to the persons who conceptualized this project and initially um, got it going. It was conceptualized by one of the Marine Lab staff, Ms. Dina Lee Douglas. Um, she has since moved on to greener pastures, but we want to give her credit for conceptualizing this project. And also this evening, I would also like to um, give special mention to Mr. Peter Gale, who has given the Marine Lab many, many years of service. And in fact, I'm going to ask if you'd, per, if you'd allow me for us to observe one minute of silence in memory of the late Peter Gale, beginning now. Thank you very much. So this project is named Evaluating Discovery Bay Inshore, Wat Inshore Coastal Water Quality to Improve Capacity for Environmental Management. And the project has several components, including assessing the water quality in Discovery Bay, looking at the phosphates, the nitrates, also looking at the coliform levels which come from our sewage. And we have a very capable team here today, Ms. Abigail Richards and Delroy will be sharing with you. Abigail will be sharing the water quality results. And we're also looking at the community perceptions in terms of pollution. We wanted to ask people in the community, what is pollution? How can we fix it? How do you feel about it? Those kind of questions. So um, special thanks also to the staff who have been working on this. Abigail Richards, Delroy Thorny, Lee Coy Coley. We also have Michelle A. Hales, a um, couple other interns at the Marine Lab, Marine Lab staff generally, and special mention this evening to our Aloha volunteers, community members. So we had three gentlemen, and if you just turn the camera on them just for a second, right? So the three gentlemen there, right? And um, they were instrumental in getting the results of this project because one component of the project we helped to teach these gentlemen to dive to help to collect the water samples and we also have one young lady who is Janil and they are definitely um, an important part of the team they this project is really for them 
because they are members of the community. So we definitely have to facilitate their growth in terms of skill sets. So we have persons training water quality testing, persons training scuba diving, and one other important part, they also help with the collection of the data for the questionnaire, which we were having some little struggles with, but when we incorporated members of the community, it went like a hot knife through butter. So very, very much appreciate their willingness and the energy in the project, and thank you for coming on board. And of course, Mr. Sean Scott, who is the, the supervisor for the sanctuary, helped to put it all together. Okay? So, and special thanks to the GF funding team, especially Ms. Um, Hyacinth Douglas, for helping to, to coordinate the project from the, the GF um, Small Grants Project angle. So thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to the results from the, um, the, the Marine Lab team in terms of what did we get and what did we find. Thank you very much. All right, lovely introduction, Mr. Trentry. Thank you for that very much. So now our special guests and viewers online would like to draw attention to Ms. Abigail Richards, our scientific officer who is currently in charge of the program, the project and she will be giving you some insights into the results. So, Ms. Abigail? Okay, good afternoon again. Um, my name is Abigail Richards, a scientific officer at the Marine Lab. So, today's presentation title is Evaluating Discovery Bay Inshore Coastal Water Quality to improve capacity for environmental management. Now, it is a bit of a mouthful, but in essence, it's just the evaluation of Discovery Bay marine water quality and to see what recommendations can be made from it. The presentation will take the following format. I'll first give you some background information into Discovery Bay and the marine water quality here. We look at the challenges faced by the community members and its significance. We look at objectives and method results and then get into the recommendations. So Discovery Bay. Discovery Bay is located on the north coast of uh, Jamaica in uh, Senton. It is originally a support base for workers at the backside plant. However, it is home to one of the most widely studied coral reefs in the world. And when you think of coral reefs, what do you think about? You think about its beauty, right? You think about all the recreational activities that can take place there, like snorkeling, diving. So we see it as an economic source for tourism. But when we think about coral reefs, we also think about it as a home for other organisms like fishes, conch, lobsters. So we see it as an economic source for fishermen as well. So if coral reefs or the marine environment is, um, quality is declining, we see where these industries would take a hit. And over the years, from 1970 to now, we have seen coral cover has decreased from 52% to 3% whereas macroalgae cover has increased from 4% to 92%. So no longer, no longer do you see beautiful coral reefs like these, but now we see coral reefs like this, where corals are dying, or we see them being overridden with macroalgae. And this is of significance because macroalgae, they use up the oxygen in the water so it prevents coral reefs from flourishing, or they use up like the nutrients in the water that the organisms and the coral reefs would need. But what is causing this? Well, literature links this to persons that use daily La point I show that increased nutrients from land-based sources like soak away pits, pit flattering runoffs, or leaching from farmlands are a cause. Just like how we need nutrients like nitrates or phosphates to grow our crops, so too when these are in a large abundance in the marine environment, overgrowth of macroalgae will happen. This is also, macroalgae can also grow from overfishing, 
when we take away the fishes from the reef, especially the juvenile fish, we don't have enough of them to eat the macroalgae off the reefs. And I'm going back to point one here. Nutrients can also come from underground springs, springs that lead from land into the sea. So, but we speak more on that going forward. Other challenges that we see include coliform, specifically fecal coliform. And this is really just bacteria that come from sewage or feces. And there are indication that pollutants or disease causing organisms may have entered the bay from fecal matter. And when sewage or excess nutrients or organic load is in the bay, is in the bay, the oxygen levels tend to deplete because microorganisms use oxygen to break down either the feces that come into the bay or the algae. So we'll be looking at all these factors because we see when there's excess nutrients, when there's high levels of coliform or low oxygen levels, the industries in Discovery Bay take a hit, especially, especially the fishing industry that so heavily depend on our coral reef and the marine water quality here. So talking about fishermen, the ALOA, Discovery Bay Fishers Association, who is a representative voice for local fishermen, collaborate with the Discovery Bay Marine Lab to see what can be done about this? How can we preserve our environment, not only for us, but also for our children going forward? So they seek funding, seek assistance from the Global Environment Facility Small Grants Program. And they are a program that provides financial and technical support to projects aimed at conserving and restoring the environment, which we're interested in. They also fund community-based initiatives so as to improve global environmental health and they enhance people's well-being and livelihoods. So we checked the box for what we were looking to do. So gaining assistance from the Global Environment Facility, Facility Small Grants Program implemented by UNDP, these are our project aims. It was to assess the water quality in Discovery Bay specifically to look for monitoring the nutrient levels during wet and dry seasons. Two, to determine the status of the coral reefs, to see if we could establish any link between the nutrient content in the bay and reef health. Also, is to assess the community attitudes to pollution. And four, to train community members in sample and data collection. Because we, as the Discovery Bay Marine Lab, we didn't just want to collect the data, but we wanted to incorporate the community in helping us to collect the data so that they could have a better understanding of what's going on. But from my presentation, we'll focus on objective one and two, and definitely objective four. The picture over here is of one of our Aloha um, volunteers, Mr. Rico, who helped us collect water samples at times. Where did we do our project? Here we are looking at a map, looking at a map of Discovery Bay. Discovery Bay is approximately 1.5 kilometers wide, and it has an area of 1.42 kilometers square. At its middle, we have a maximum depth of 56 meters. It has a reef that encloses it that runs from west to east. Along the bay and the Western section of the bay, we have the Discovery Bay Marine Lab. Coming around, we have Columbus Park. In the middle of the bay here, we have the Naranda Backside Pier. Going around Eastern section, we have the Old Folly Sea, Old Folly Community Area. And we have Puerto Seco in the Eastern section and Fortland Strip going around. So here you can see 11, 11 sample points. West Bay, Columbus Park, one kilometer outside of the Bay, Red Boy, Portland, Fisherman Beach, and so on. But it is key that even though you just seen 11 sample points, we collected both surface and depth samples. And what is special about Discovery Bay is not just seawater, it's also contained multiple springs, multiple 
cracks within the seabed. Hello? Multiple cracks within uh, the seabed from which fresh water enters the bay from the land. So water from land enter the sea through these opening or cracks bringing nutrients or other pollutants. At these sample sites, we check for total nitrogen, phosphate, biological oxygen demand, and codiform. As was mentioned before, total nitrogen and phosphate are needed for macroalgal growth, so we would need to assess the levels in the bay. We look at biological oxygen demand, and this is really just checking the oxygen levels in the bay. The higher, the more storage or more macroalgae there is, there are microorganisms would use up more of the oxygen to break these down, which would make biological oxygen demand high. Um, we look at coliform. We look at coliform levels as well to see if there's any indication of sewage or fecal matter entering the bay. So we also did underwater monitoring of uh, coral reefs. Um, to carry out our nutrient analysis and coral reef analysis, community members, specifically from fishermen from Aloha, um, helped us with this. Here we have Mr. Mario, Mr. Shango, and Mr. Rico helping us carry out coral reef survey. So let's jump into the results. What did we find? Phosphate levels. This graph here is showing the average phosphate levels for each of our sample points. And this is the average phosphate levels from September 2018 to 2020. Um, the, the value in red here is the ambient standard, uh, is Jamaican's ambient standard value. That's the level that's accepted to be in the bay. And if we look at these figures here, we see that each site passes this accepted value, which is 0 0.0031 to 0 0.0092 milligram phosphate per liter. But looking specifically at the individual sites, we do not see any significant difference between them. That's just the surface samples now. Let's look at the depth samples. The same trend except for old Folly Road drain. Consistently, we see that it has a spike elevated levels of, uh, okay. consistently we see it as elevated values of uh, phosphate. And to put this into context for you, Old Folly Road Drain is uh, around the Old Folly area. And it's, and it's actually a drain that is running from the road into the sea. So we see that uh, high levels of phosphate are being recorded at this area. Let's look at monthly phosphate trends. Now these phosphate trends are showing us how the phosphate levels vary over different months. Because we wanted to see if there was a difference in wet season versus dry season. Wet season being the months that rain a lot versus the dry season or the rest of the months in Jamaica. And then, but looking at our surface samples, we saw no significant difference. And for depth, also no significant difference, even though we saw elevated levels in September 2018. This was not replicated afterwards, so we could not say that in September high levels are seen. More data would need to be collected. Let's look at our nitrogen data. So this graph here is showing the average total nitrogen for each of our sample sites. Um, no significant difference we're seeing between the sites except for, again, all folly road drain, the surface samples. Depth samples were relatively the same. But all folly, once again, we see spike in not just phosphate, but also nitrogen. Looking at our multi-nitrogen trends, monthly nitrogen trends, we see that there was a spike in nitrate in one of our wet months, which was May for our surface samples. And for our depth samples, there was a spike in September and July. Now, 
May and September are considered wet months. July this year, we could debate that it was a bit wet. So we could say nitrogen seemed to be increasing in levels in the wetter months, but more studies may be needed to confirm this. Jumping into our biological oxygen demand. I remember I said this is just basically telling us the oxygen levels in the water. And you know that oxygen is important for the microorganisms, for the fishes, the organisms, and uh, such. But thankfully, each of our sites were within range, accept us, acceptable standard range. None of the sites pass, none of the sites were above were above this level that was, uh, which is the Jamaica standard ambient water quality standard. So our BOD levels, our oxygen levels are fine. Um, looking at our total coliform levels, this graph here is showing total coliform for some of our key study areas. In red, we have the standard acceptable range, which is two to 256, most probable number per 100. Mills. We saw a total coliform fisherman beach specifically at a high total coliform, high total coliform levels and by Fortland Strip. And could we account for this? Well, Fortland Strip is a residential area, so it is, it is possible that fecal matter of some sort could enter the bay. Fisherman Beach, well, there's always like dogs over there, so that could be a contributing factor as well. Puerto Sequels actually had higher levels as well. But just to focus specifically on the fecal coliforms, which are coliforms from sewage, we saw that all fall erosion, 60% of the time had elevated fecal coliform levels. And Fort Land Strip had elevated levels about 20% of the time. So these areas need to be monitored. Now, that was just our nutrient analysis. Right? Looking at our coral reef survey, in our coral reef survey, we only looked at six sites. We looked at Echo Reef, Discovery Bay, Boat Channel, and Red Boy Reef, which are our spring sites, the areas where there are cracks in the seafloor, where nutrients may enter, fresh water is entering. We also looked at all folly, Puerto Seco, and a control, which is outside of the bay. And what we're seeing is that coral cover is exceptionally low. For all of the sites, it was below 10%. The average is about 7%, whereas macroalgae cover, is between anywhere between 30 and 76%. At our quarries, there were also high levels of sand and pavement. And to a lesser extent, we found sponges and other invertebrates, like sea cucumbers and such. Looking at our fish data on the reefs, the, fishes that, the fish that were most in abundance were surgeon fish, parish fishes and to a lesser extent, we found snappers, angelfish, and such. So what are we concluded? Well, our nutrient hotspots from my presentation would be, uh, what do you think, uh, although it's there already? All fall drain. And to remind you, this is the drain here. Now, significant difference we're seeing in the phosphate levels, however, in the wet and dry months. So for nitrogen concentration, we saw elevated levels in September, May, and July, which are, were rainy months then. Um, coliform hotspots, we saw that it was Old Folly Road Drain, Fisherman Beach, and Fort Land Strip. Looking at average coral cover, like what it was in the literature, it was exceptionally low. We saw average coral cover in the bay of about 3.3%, whereas macroalgae was about 56.2%. And linking sample sites to coral reef sites, we saw that Old Folly Road Drain, which was a nutrient hotspot, had one of the greatest alcohol cover as well, and the lowest coral cover. And to remind you where it was, so, what are our recommendations? 
where there are soakaway pits in Discovery Bay, remove them, replace them with wastewater treatment plants. This will help us prevent coliform from fecal matters from entering the bay and from increasing coliform levels. Uh, we need to have better use of fertilizers to prevent leaching because leaching would cause nutrients like nitrates and phosphate to enter the bay. We need to have better enforcement of fishing regulation so that juvenile fishes don't, aren't taken from the bay and other stuff. And overall, we need a personal responsibility of each member of the community to help us preserve the bay for not us, but just us and our children. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Delroy Thorny, who will talk on the community's perception on pollution. Yes. Any questions? Check. Yes, this is in reference to old folly drain. Just identify yourself. The name is Henry Brady. Yes, sir. And this is in reference to the old folly drain. The drain by Porto The drain by Porto Seco, which is almost similar to that in old folly. So why is such a great difference? The drain by Puerto Rico? Yes, that goes by the, the army camp. It's not much different from the drain that is in Old Folly. I don't think that was one of our sampling points, so we could have compared those two. No, but Old Folly figures are so high, yeah, sir. yet the one that is similar, the drain that is similar mm -hmm. by the camp is so low. Now, the only difference I see is the Old Folly, apart from the drain, is also the mining is where mining is done. The shipping pier is that. Okay. So would that affect your numbers? Would it affect the bauxite that is being escaping into the water? Would that also affect your numbers? It could because there are phosphate levels in bauxite, so that is actually could be a contributing factor as well. But just to your point, at Puerto Rico, we did not test the the drain area. We test the beach or beside the dolphin pen. Huh? Okay, okay. Yes, dolphin. Yes, the box I could have actually contributed to. What we call the old folly drain isn't the big gully near. The old folly drain is actually a small um, drain which is closer to along the, the main road there where the couple of bars and shops are. So this is not the big gully next to the bauxite land. So it is unlikely you're seeing any bauxite influence there. Nor do I think bauxite has a high nutrient content, phosphate, right? So what the point is, these results kind of show us that there's more to be studied about it. And we know that there's an impact there and that era has consistently high nutrients, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really tell us why. We just know that this is a problem area so it is something worth looking into further. So we cannot say it's bauxite. I, I highly doubt it's bauxite. Right. Definitely. So those are, so the results kind of show us these are some hot spots that we need to have a clue. Now that we know that a problem is there, we need to have a closer look at what is there. And another thing is that, remember in our presentation, um, Discovery Bay has a lot of freshwater upwellings as well. So you have to also look at those a little bit closer as well because it's not necessarily something from a house. It could be the underwater river which is coming from miles away. I'm wondering if the ballast water that the ship sometimes, uh, what, what would you say now? Expel or release into the bay, mm -hmm. wouldn't that also affect the water quality, especially in that era that we are mentioning, Old Folly? It could, but more, mostly based on sedimentation, not necessarily the phosphate levels. Um, actually, the sediments coming from the bauxite could actually trap more phosphate that's in the water and hold it in uh, the seabed. So we would have to look more into 
the bauxite here to say, to say that it's a contributing factor. This is a drain that was sampled. It wasn't sampled close to the bauxite pier. So I don't think you can really attribute things here to the bauxite. Uh, uh, very, un very unlikely. And the fact that this has consistently high nutrient levels, whether or not bauxite was going out, that cannot tell a story. So it's kind of independent. So something is happening there all the time. Something is happening there all the time, for sure. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Insert Pottinger. I'm from Farm Town. Um, I think the problem that you guys are having right there is um, it has to do with the, the water table. Right in that basin, because I snorkel that area a lot. And right in that basin, you have a lot of spring coming out in that area. And I think the problem that's happening there is raw sewage. Yeah, because the, 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 the houses over on the other side probably don't have septic. Well, so, well fecal coliform levels were consistently high in that area, so that is definitely a possibility. Yeah, no, that is the problem. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No? All right, so now I'll hand over to Delroy Thorny, who will look at the, co the community perception and pollution. Thank you very much, Ms. Richards, for that lovely presentation. I'm sure everyone learned a lot. So, as she mentioned earlier, my name is Delroy Thorny. I'm the outreach officer at the Discover Bay Marine Lab. Now, as a part of output number three's mandate of the project, we had to look into the insights of the public's perception towards pollution. So, a few things that we had to pay attention to were the issuance of surveys. So, questionnaires were mandatory to get the thoughts of the local residents here and even residents who were just passing through to get their understanding of the effects of pollution in the area. So, without understanding the levels of pollution from people in the area, we can't really tell them that, oh, we're going to fix it for you, or we're going to give you a solution without understanding where they are coming from first. Now, for the procedure, it's pretty straightforward. We had members from the Aloha team, volunteers, were mentioned earlier, who were handpicked by Aloha, as well as members from the UA Discovery Bay Marine Lab team. Now, we have to especially thank the Aloha members, the volunteers. You guys are very instrumental in getting the surveys out there and getting the vast numbers it was very helpful. And a myriad of sites were visited. If you look on the image right here to the left, that is a picture from the Fisherman's Beach on the eastern side of the bay. And COVID-19 happened, so a lot of things had to change as well. So in spite of the whole COVID-19 outbreak, we had to ensure the safety of our volunteers, our workers. So we had to make sure that protocol were observed by the government. So we had our masks were being worn, sanitizer, and then to reduce the amount of physical contact as well, we also developed an online survey. Now, this presentation reached approximately 5% of the population. Discovery Bay has roughly a little over 2,000 residents, so we got to interview roughly 5% of them, and here you can see volunteers going through the questionnaire together to discuss how they'll approach the residents. Now, the results were compiled and we'll be giving you a brief overview of what we found. So first thing we have to look at is the age demography of those who were interviewed. If you pay attention to the graph, you notice that majority of them fell within the 21 to 30 age group. 
and then followed by them were the 31 to 40, and everything else fell underneath that. So we ensure that we got a wide age range. It's pretty much balanced almost straight throughout. So everybody got a say in this presentation. And in terms of education level, no one was left out. If your most recent graduate level is not at the university level, then you got a say as well. So we have technical trainees, high school graduates, tertiary level, primary school, postgraduates, and even people with primary level education, and they each gave their say. Now, for those who were interviewed, over 65% of them live in the Discovery Bay area, and they have a very extensive knowledge of the area due to that tenure that they've been there. While you have over 59% having residents just because of work reasons, and then we have visitors around 9%. Now, the occupation of these people are from a wide range of different industries. Majority of them were from the service industry, followed by agriculture and fisheries and skilled laborers. And then followed by that we have retired individuals, self-employed, and people from the education sector. And many of these residents who were interviewed, they have been in this career for over 10 years, over 50%. So this should give us a good insight into how people actually view pollution in Discovery Bay. Now, first thing that we need to do is talk about what is pollution. Now, this defini these definitions, actually, were definitions which are given by residents of the area. So some of them mentioned that pollution is the addition of toxic or harmful substances to the area. Some said that it is the introduction of toxic waste into the environment. Some said that it's just littering and damaging of the environment. And others say it's the contamination of the environment. But it doesn't stop there. Many people have different definitions. We weren't able to put all of them in the presentation, but we'll highlight a few of them. Others say it's any negative change in the environment. There's also littering with rubbish, factories letting out waste materials and plastic. Others even said introduction of any unwanted harmful or hazardous substance. So people have a very good understanding of pollution, I would say, based on these definitions. And then there's other stuff as well. Pollution through sound and air, the presence of an environment which has a negative effects. So people are paying attention to the environment, and that's a good thing. Now, when you're talking about pollution, people tend to wonder if pollution affects industry in the area. Now, this industry in which you're talking about includes tourism, the fishing industry, local businesses, and over 79%, approximately 80% of people said that they do believe that tourism industry and all these other industries are being affected by pollution. As Ms. Richards pointed out earlier, if you have a poor coral reef health, then industries such as snorkeling and fishing will fall. So people are paying attention and they do know what's going on. Now, the extent of the pollution. When we ask residents how polluted they think the Discovery Bay Marine environment is, approximately 39% said it's slightly polluted, while 35 said it is moderately polluted. So in terms of heavily polluted, only 18% thinks that it is, and then you have small amounts, 5 and 8% said they don't know. But in general, most people think the Discovery Bay area has some level of pollution, and that is something that needs to be addressed. Now, in terms of what the major pollutants are, if we look on the graph over here, 68%, this large chunk on the map right there, that is solid waste. So this is what we asked the public. What do they think the major pollutants are? And we gathered all that information and put it into representative groups, and majority of them agree that solid waste is the major pollutant in the area. Now, when we asked the members of the community, 
What do they think is being done to prevent pollution? These are the list of things in which they said. Majority of them said garbage collection, followed by beach cleanups, and some people say nothing is being done. A large portion of them say nothing is being done, 16%, while 22% says it's garbage collection. And aside from that, the other minor things which people think are happening include education awareness, catchment grills and storm drains, community cleanups, signs and bins recycling, and so on. So these are things which people notice in the environment that is being done. When it comes on to pollutants that they observe, the specific types of pollutants, many members of the community stated that plastic is the major pollutant in the area. So we're talking about solid waste, we're talking directly about the litter that they find, the plastic over here. Before it was styrofoam boxes, before the ban, and now you have plastic containers and plastic bags that are still in the area. These are still issues that have to be dealt with on a local level. In terms of more harmful things like sewage, 12% said they noticed where sewage might be an issue, as a young gentleman earlier mentioned the septic tanks, the Sokoe pits, which are not septic tanks, so people have Sokoe pits in the area and that may influence the, and that can influence the marine health. And the next thing that is very important is where is pollution happening? Just knowing that pollution is happening is important, but if you don't know where it is happening, that is an issue because you can't tackle the issue. Majority of the respondents noted that 29%, that is, says most of that is on the beachfronts, followed by 25%, which the roads. So majority over 50% says that the beachfront and the roads are the major areas in which they encounter pollution. There are many other areas as well. People say they see pollution in front of the supermarkets, the gullies, near the police station, by Old Folly, at other people's homes in the area. So people are paying attention. So if we're not paying attention, somebody else is paying attention to where the pollution is coming from. Now, when we ask individuals what they think can be done to curtail the effects of pollution, we ask them to create some laws for us. And the people were very creative. They came up with a bunch of different ideas, which some are existing, just may not be enforced as much, and some are thinking. People are really thinking. Majority of people say that fines should be put in place, and they're not talking about any small $1,000 fines or another local $200, $500 fines. People want some big fines to be put in place for pollution because they love their environment. And people want to ensure that the environment is protected because if it is not protecting, then they lose out and we all lose out. And in terms of other laws, people mention that we should ban soak-away pits. People would like more enforcement of laws, jail time, Penalties such as hard labor was mentioned as well. And uh, some people are saying tax the businesses for waste control. So people want to see what is happening in the Discovery Bay. They want to see these things happening. And in terms of water, in water waste material, a small percentage said that they should restrict sea animal captivity because there's an argument that having dolphins which produce high waste material can pollute the bay as well. But currently, the dolphins are not in the bay, so residents have been happy for that. And when we ask the people, how do you think the government can help the situation? These are what they came up with. So 20% mentioned that the government can install more trash bins around the area. They would like to just walk on the road, see that they have a piece of trash in their hand, they can just throw it in the bin and then have garbage collection take place to collect it. And then 16%, the second largest amount said that the government needs to instill more cleanup in the area. And other minor things which people recommended were 
put in place toxin controls, more skips, fines and penalties, employ more cleaners, and more education drive. So these are the list of things which people want the government to do for them. And what are the current pollution reduction efforts? What is being done currently? When asked, the responses which we got mostly geared towards nothing. Most people say over 50 per, over 35 percent. People said that nothing is really being done, and then you have a small 22 percent that says they don't know, and then 16 percent says it's garbage collection. There are other minor things which are noteworthy are people are saying there's a cut down of factory hours. So for instance, the Noranda Bauxite Company gives off a lot of dust, so that's air pollution. They're saying that they cut down on that, so they're grateful for that. They're also saying that there have been some bin provision by the CDC, and there's also more water quality being done, water quality testing. And they also mentioned that they've noticed signs and they've seen where coastal cleanups have been taking place. And the residents have been giving their voice about other individuals. So I'm going to ask them to talk about themselves now. Majority of them say that how they can reduce pollution is by having more trash receptacles, more beach and road cleanups. So community members are interested in being involved in all these things. They want to feel empowered knowing that they can develop their own community. And if they can develop their own community, they can have a sense of self-pride. And with this sense of self-pride, then the community will be uplifted and then you can see it prospering a lot more. Now, in terms of who is responsible for pollution, over 60% mentioned that everyone is responsible for pollution. It's not just the industry. It's not just scientists, it's not local citizens, it is everyone. If you are a member of the community and you see a piece of trash on the ground that somebody, one of your cohorts, decided to throw it right beside you, it's your responsibility to reprimand that individual and tell them, listen, it's our community, let's keep it clean. So majority of the individuals who are interviewed believe that this is the way to go. We should all take an important part in curtailing the effects of pollution. And when we talked to everybody, we had to get their say, not just options. What do you think is causing this, that, or what? We want to hear your voice. So we asked the members of the community to give us their input, some little comments on what they think is going on. Now, some people say that Discovery Bay doesn't have that bad a pollution problem, but they do believe that dust pollution is a thing that is happening, and they also mention that they are appreciative of the fact that Noranda is doing checks on the air quality to make sure that pollution is not going above a certain standard. Others mention that education is necessary to prevent people from causing more harm to the environment. Others also state that they would like to see more garbage trucks in the area because without garbage trucks, then all the garbage that is thrown in the garbage bins is pointless. You just keep piling up until it start tumbling over and then the windows start taking it and then the pollution becomes even greater. So we need to see more garbage trucks. That's what the things that they're saying. Members of the community, they want to see more garbage trucks. And people are saying that we need to pay attention to climate change as well. We can't just focus on just getting rid of certain plastics and stuff. Climate change is important, so we need to watch what we're doing, like burning certain things, damaging the environment. And we need to adhere to the laws which are stipulated by local government and by the government on a whole. Some people, think that bauxite is causing a lot of air pollution. Some people disagree. 
Some people, as we said, one said that Naranda is controlling it, another set says that it's causing pollution. So Naranda Bauxite Company actually does air quality checks regularly, and that is done by a filter placed remote, on a remote location at a distance away from the Naranda Bauxite Company, which wind would blow the dust all around the air. So Naranda is doing their part in ensuring that the air quality is good for all of us. Other things, people want to see NEPA improve their presence in their operations in the Discovery Bay. NEPA, the regulating body, National Environment and Planning Agency, people believe that they need to play an active part in curtailing pollution. As well as people should just be responsible overall. We can't keep blaming each other for pollution when we're not doing our part to prevent it. Others mentioned that dolphin waste is affecting the fishing and swimming industry, and they're saying it destroys the reef thanks to the excess pollution. And then beach cleanups should become a more regular thing. People in the area should just come together and do beach cleanups for the sake of beach cleanup to keep their environment clean. And there are also comments about the Discovery Bay Marine Lab. People are saying we're doing an awesome job and they say we should keep it up and we'll definitely do so because we love the Discovery Bay and we love the people of Discovery Bay. And in conclusion, we need to understand that we are all an important element in the Discovery Bay environmental protection. So from that, we can tell that people are aware of what's going on in the Discovery Bay. Most residents seem very aware of pollution, the effects of pollution, what it is, and that's good, because if they did not know, then we could not curtail the issue through education and through physical interaction and cleanups. And most residents believe that solid waste and air pollution are the major concerns in the area. So we need to look more into that to ensure that residents are comfortable with the environment that they're in and that there are no issues going forward. And a consensus was reached that fines and enforcement are definitely needed to prevent pollution from getting any worse. And with that, we'd like to say thank you all for taking the time to join us in this presentation. We'd like to make a few acknowledgements. Mr. Trench made reference to a few already. We'd like to make reference to the Global Enhancement Facility Special Grants Program, which is, uh, which is, funded, which is operated by the United Nations Development Program. The Aloha team, we'd like to thank you for being here and for playing an integral role. The Discovery Bay Marine Lab team, we'd like to thank you as well. Volunteers, we appreciate you. Ms. Dina Lee Douglas, one of our initial scientific officers on the program. The community members, all of you, those who took the time to be here and those who took the time to answer our questions and assist on a daily basis, we'd like to thank you as well. And to the late Peter Gale, who was very instrumental in spearheading this project with Mr. Sean Ascott. And with that, we'd like to say thank you all for being here and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Now, do you guys have any other questions? Any questions? Okay, my name is Sophia Nevers, and my comment is on the section that you said, what is being done in the prevention of pollution? Now, a lot of um, persons gave their responses. However, I think what they said were measures to take care of pollution. They mentioned garbage collection, etc. But if no garbage was placed there, if no pollution was done, then there would have been no measure to go and pick up the garbage. Another thing that was said was also fines. Now, somebody might be passed, might be going along the road, but there is no rule that says don't throw rubbish there. Now, I would suggest that, um, for example, the marine lab and those persons who are mentioned there um, couldn't 
you put, for example, some posts, some signposts, no garbage here, or, for example, keep your community clean, you know, some form of education, especially where garbage is piled up. Now, that is when the fine would come in. If garbage is, if they see you putting it there, then because that sign is there, or if I am a person who loves to throw out my garbage, and when I go, I see that day, I'm going to be looking to see if somebody is seeing me, so I'm not going to put it there. So, you know, get some form of education in that way. Put some things around the community for persons to see, and then this would help to minimize them putting garbage around. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Nevers. That was a very good point. More signs do need to be put in the Discord Bay area. It is an initiative which we have been trying to get in place. Some signs have been put up already, but the, the plan is to get more out there. Once you get more out there, people will be more aware. And once there is more awareness, we can also get more compliance with people. And another thing is that we definitely will be having more awareness campaigns as we go going forward, because without education campaign for individuals, then you find that most people will probably say, oh, but we never hear. So they never hear, most people just be act ignorant because they are ignorant to the situation, and then they will act non-compliant. So education is definitely key in this situation, and having signs available. Let me just add to that though. Um, if I may add to that though, there is actually a law that says you're not permitted to throw your garbage and your ground are scattered all over the place. There is an anti litter law in Jamaica. That's not the name of it, but there is an existing law. But as you can imagine, it's not a very popular law to enforce. And um, I think really and truly it should be enforced by the municipal corporation. So your, your councillors and so on are the persons who will enforce that. But one thing that kind of, I'm not so sure if anybody kind of picked it up, but one thing that is damning about these results to me is that most persons see pollution as garbage like this, right? But one of the major pollutants in Discovery Bay is not this what you can see, is the nutrients in the water. And we saw that, the coliform. The coliform means basically it's coming from your toilet. Okay? So a lot of persons see this as the pollutant. Well, really and truly, this is a bad pollutant, but it is stuff from the toilet which is threatening the coral reef because, I mean, this does threaten the coral reef too, but most of this floats. So we do have an issue with solid waste as well as sewage. And... Um, Really and truly, a lot of the issues we have, not just in this Discovery Bay, but in Jamaica, comes down to the management from the municipal corporations. I don't know if persons are aware, but even in the slides that came up, persons were saying NEPA should do more. But really and truly, who should really do the pollution control in terms of the soakaway pits and the garbage is who? Your parish council. So let's bear that in mind. So that is something that, yes, we can tackle as a community. So maybe Aloha, CDC, Discovery Bay, Marine Lab, maybe we can get together and do some projects to make sure that we protect Discovery Bay. But really and truly, <coughs> even though it's a good initiative to do, we have to bear in mind that it is really not our responsibility in the strictest sense. Maybe we are going to take it on, but it's not really our responsibility. It's something that you pay for in your taxes. All right, so be that in mind. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, man. All right, pleasant good afternoon. I'm the PA system guy. <laughs> um, I must commend you guys about um, regarding the study. I have a friend who used to work at the Marine Lab some years ago. So I know the challenges that you guys face, along with some of the joys as well. Um, I also work against well, along a shoreline in Kingston. So I also understand also, you know, the whole concept of the study that you are doing. But um, my major concern is, and if this is done, I suspect that it can help in terms of the pollution that we have in our waters, is 
the monetizing of recyclables, right? Now, if you go on the roadside or even anywhere, what you will see, you will see plastics, you will see paper, you will see styrofoam, but you're not going to see a Heineken bottle. You're not going to see a red stripe bottle because these recyclables are monetized. So in other jurisdictions across the world, what helped with their hard, we want to call it now, them hard plastics and so forth in terms of not getting into their water systems is uh, monetizing. They monetize paper, they monetize plastic, they monetize even glass bottle. You buy a tropical rhythm, no, you have to dash out the bottle. Versus in other jurisdictions, you have to pay, you, you get a five cent off or whatever. So I think they are, I'm encouraging the mine lab to not only to not, not only to, to say, okay, we are in Discovery Bay, but to move your research in where other water bodies are concerned. Not, not only to stick to things that will attract tourists, but for instance, where I work on the Kingston Harbor, we are affected a lot by, especially the gentleman complained about a drain. You, if you see industrial terrace when it come down, you understand what I say? So use this knowledge to lobby the government to lobby the manufacturers who are creating the, the products that the byproducts of these products are what is causing the pollution, right? So while it is, my boss, I agree with you too in terms of the leaching and the other pollutants that we can't see, but I think that if we start by setting an example with the pollutants that we can see, right, it, it, will, it, it will put the manufacturers on the back foot to say, okay, if they are drawing up these individuals, I mean, if I make my fertilizer, for me sure say, boy, I, pro I provide proper handling material, because this is also the next thing again, the culture. I'm on a fertilizing field, I'm just dash down fertilizer. I remember being in Knoxwood, buying some, um, that's so St. Elizabeth for those who don't know, right? And I said to the sweet pepper man, what do you sweet pepper? Him say, um, what's my name? Seven star rain. Seven star rain, one name so. He's not educated as to the concept of acid rain. You get what I mean? I say, I'm going to say to him, say, sometime, brother, if you don't use the proper fertilizer, per, for, for example, something that is properly soluble in water, or if you use too much, you understand what I mean? I say, again, get yourself in a problem, you're going to burn up your crops. So the, 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 the persons who are importing the fertilizers to use on farms need to provide the necessary educational campaign and information for the farmers to ensure that they don't contribute to your, to your pollution problem. So kudos to you guys and the work that you are doing and keep it up and whatever support I can provide, I will provide. Thank you very much. Now, we thank you for that comment. It was a very insightful comment. And we'd also like to point out that one of the mandates of the Discovery Marine Lab is research as well as outreach and education. So whatever we learn at the Marine Lab, we normally put it out there for others to access. So in terms of reaching out to governments, government agencies, NGOs, if information is needed, we can just be contacted and we also give out information at times to help others understand what is going on. So whenever there is an issue and we research into it, we try our best to involve the government. For example, the lionfish invasive species, when we had that issue all across the island, the Discovery Bay was very instrumental in getting information about that organism, studying it, and that information we shared with the nation. And as a result, we've seen a decline in the lionfish population and there is no more worries in regards to that. So people getting stung by lionfish, people losing out in the fish industry due to lionfish, that has fallen. So any information that we do get, we will do our best to share with others because education is key for success. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. Special thanks to our viewers online and everyone who has an interest in protecting our environment we do charge all of you to do your part as well, as we do our part. And we'd like to say thank you. Until next time, signing out, the Discovery Marine Lab and Aloha team.